Hello everyone, Justin here from the Hangfire Podcast, here today with another episode of Stones Riffs, a series on our channel where we sit and riff on the stones. I am very excited to welcome my guest today, a prolific author and music historian who has written some amazing books on many important musical figures in rock and roll. He's here today to talk about a book he's written about the Rolling Stones, Undercover, 500 Rolling Stones cover versions that you must hear. It's an incredible volume of, there it is, it's beautiful, oh my God. An incredible volume of a book that collects 500 cover versions of Stone songs. It's a fantastic book and super fun to read through. So please welcome Peter Chexfield. Hello, Peter. How are you? Hello. Thank you. Oh, my God. I'm so glad that, that you're here and you showed that book, the cover, because the cover alone is also, it's very intriguing, isn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does draw you in, really, doesn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. You get lost in it because you're, you're looking at all the different you know, artwork and you, you start to put it together like, wow, this has, this kind of goes all over the gamut of different artists. Yeah. Yeah. It really does. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, obviously, yeah, the, the, the Rolling Stones, well, they, they, they've done a varied repertoire, you know, like reggae and, you know, dis touching on disco and other things and funk, but, uh, but some of the artists who, you know, I mean, uh, for instance, I got, she's so cold covered by a string quartet. Yeah, you know, it's just bizarre. Some of them, you know, it really are. I, I I heard you talk about that somewhere else, and I ran to look that up because I thought, oh, how can that work? Because you said it worked so well, I went, oh, please. I went, it does. It does. It does. Yeah. Oh my God. We'll we'll talk about that one a little bit more because that that is a fascinating um, clip, but. Um, you know, this was when, when I when I came across this book. Uh, this was a book that I didn't know I needed so badly. You know, because I could only name maybe, you know, five or ten Stones cover songs. You know, and I thought I, there's no way I could possibly amass in my collection all the ones, at least five hundred of them, like you have. So, you know, first thought that comes to mind is what brought you to this idea, and how long did it take you to collect these five hundred? Uh, quite a few I already had. Well, what is? I've been writing and uh, publishing books uh, for about five years, five and a half years, and uh, this was about my tenth or eleventh book. But uh, one of my very favourite acts, uh, Rolling Stones, Brian Jones era. You know, uh, up, up until up until Between the Buttons, perhaps Satanic Majesties. That is my favourite. I mean, I appreciate all the later stuff. I really do. But uh, but uh, you know. I just I just needed a new angle, and I don't, I don't know how it come to me, you know. And I'm just listening to covers, and I think finally I can do something on the Rolling Stones. So, you know, and that's how it happened. It probably took me I don't know about six months and a, qu quite a lot of money because I had to you know, buy a lot of obscure records. Some are on Spotify or YouTube, but some I had to you know dig out you know, old records or you know, obscure CDs and whatever. So. That's amazing. I imagine you work on this book and you had your Indiana Jones hat on because it seemed like an archaeological dig in a way. It is. It is. Yeah. Well, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, that's fantastic. It's a music archaeological dig. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and as I said, uh, you know, the, the 63 to 67 is my favorite. And I did my best to find at least one cover of every Rolling Stone song due, during that period. I, I mean, I've covered, you know, several from every other album later. And uh I pretty much did it. Uh, I mean, some are hard to find. You try finding a cover of Long, Long While or Please Go Home. But, but, but one I didn't get, but I don't know if you remember it, If You Let Me from Metamorphosis. I wanted to cover of that. So someone, please cover If You Let Me. Then I can do another edition. Yeah. <laughs> well, at the rate the stones are going, you know, you might have another 500 for the next 60 years, you know, the coming up, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, and what I love about this book, you know, there are many reasons why uh, every Stones fan should really have this book because it's a it's a nice reminder of the breadth of the music, you know, and just how much they've done and all the different styles they've done, and it's you know it's a good reminder of just how influential they were, and they have a long and wide reach, don't they? Yeah, yeah, they certainly do, and uh, I mean, uh, and and also I, I've got to say this, uh, I've, I've interviewed yeah, musicians for other books, and and often you know I'd interview ten, maybe twenty. I'm lucky, 30. But I, I wrote to about 140 people. 130 wrote back. They were so keen to talk about the Rolling Stones, you know. And, you know, and these are like, you know, you know soul singer film of Houston and people like that who you wouldn't think would be interested. But, you know, you know within a couple of days, you know, I'd get all these replies. And I was like, 
So they obviously love the stones, yeah, which, which is which is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, um, the stones are part of that class of of musicians, aren't they? That they're just beloved, and and everyone has their own little universe with them, just like uh, many other big bands from that era, you know. So I'm happy to hear that the, they people were receptive because that's what's part of also the book. The book not only lists the covers, but like you say, uh, along with each of the um, song selections, um, whatever you have one, you have an interview with the people, uh, kind of yeah. explaining how they came to pick this cover and their relationship with the Stones. And it's kind of, it's very lovely to to read that because, you know, you can tell that people have a very strong connection to the band. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and and I got a bit of a scoop. I interviewed a Rolling Stone for the book, but that, that was Dick Taylor. <laughs> Dick Taylor and the Pretty Things, who was obviously an early Rolling Stones, yeah. And later on, uh, uh, I think it was about 1999 offhand that they, uh, the Pretty Things covered Play With Fire. Fantastic uh, update of Play With Fire. So, yeah. I was interviewing Dick Taylor. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I was in heaven. So. Oh, I bet, especially considering you're such an aficionado of that early era. Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. You know, one of the things that I loved uh, that happened very early on in your book was that in your introduction, you do uh, a very good job to remind us of a very important fact that seems to be overlooked, but um, you highlighted the fact that, you know, the first part of their career was kind of remarkable that they were able to rise up so quickly in that first 18 months. They would go from, you know, playing the marquee and playing all these small little clubs and, you know, rising, rising in, in popularity with the singles. And then very quickly, they would get their own number one hit of their own composition with satisfaction. It's a great fact to remind people of, about. And I'm so glad you did it. Yeah, thank you. Uh I mean, you hear about, you know, Lennon McCartney and people like that, you know, was writing for, you know, churning out songs, you know, for six, seven years. But the Rolling Stones, you know, by their own admission, Mick and Keith didn't consider themselves songwriters. And uh, I, I believe, I found their first release composition was Stoned, which was just an instrumental, like Booker T and the MG's type instrumental. They went from that, you know, as non-songwriters, really. Within 18 months, they wrote Satisfaction. I mean... How did they develop so quickly? You know, it's, it's just, just beyond belief to me. It really is. So. Yeah, and, and, and it was that little tidbit that made me want to think about it too, that, you know, you know, we want to give, you know, um, the Stones, you know, have a lot of milestones and cool things that they've done, but no one ever realizes that in a short amount of time they were able to deliver. And, you know, it's one thing to deliver very quickly once, but, you know, at the time... What was that schedule? It's like every 12 weeks you had to come out with something. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And and they had several number ones, yeah. And, I mean, there was obviously a lot of good bands around at the time. Obviously the Beatles and the Beach Boys and the Who and the Kinks and the Birds and so many others. But, yeah, the Rolling Stones, they're right at the top. They have their own compositions very, very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I can't imagine. I mean, we, you know, around that time, things were sort of building and Keith's, problems with his own drug abuse, you know, was probably caused by a lot of this stress, you know, which of course, you know, I'm sure was mixing with the fun and the momentum of things growing. But at the same time, you know, that's a lot of pressure on a group of guys or a, music or a couple new songwriters to deliver not just a song every 12 weeks, but it had to be a hit song. And, you know, they, I, by my calculations, it looked like it was about nine top 10 hits over the course of three years after yeah. Satisfaction. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Which, is, which is unbelievable. Yeah, and uh, and obviously they wasn't just uh, you know rock. They did uh, things like Lady Jane and As Tears Go By. You know, and uh, you know more pop songs like uh, Out of Time and uh, you know, uh, you know, it wasn't wasn't just rhythm and blues inspired you know, rock. So that was the important thing. Yeah, and I'm so glad you mentioned that because I, I don't know. It seems it seems pretty like lost in the legend now that you know. Um, I guess it depends on what everyone's different exposure is to the Rolling Stones because there's so many eras to the band, as you know. And that era, the first era, was just so fertile with songs and material, but styles and textures and flavors that people kind of, you know, uh, overlook the fact that, sure, these guys did a satisfaction and get off my cloud, but, you know, Painted Black is is such a outlier in, in that yeah. whole list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and so social comment songs, I mean... I mean, you know, as we know, you know, they got into drugs, but Mother's Little Helper, you know, that's an anti-drug song. You know? Yeah. And they was doing that in 1966. That's a hit single, well, a US hit single. Yeah, so. 
I've never, I, I've never done the math on on that one, but I've always loved Mother's Little Helper. But that that's almost like a cousin to Paint It Black to me, a distant cousin, because there's some exotic sound to it. Have you looked into it uh, since you are the Indiana Jones of of music? Yeah, for a long time I did think it was actually a sitar and Mother's Little Helper, but apparently it's not. It's it's, uh, it's just guitars. Uh, you know, I suppose it's some sort of effect or whatever's Keith doing, sliding his fingers. I, I'm not technical minded on that, but. Uh, but yeah, but apparently it's just guitar. But I, yeah, I agree. It's uh, it does sound you know, just, you know, like a like a cousin, close cousin of Paint It Black, but but different. You know, right in its own way. Yeah, totally. And um, I think Mother's Little Helper is one of the few songs uh, left on Mega Fans' list to beg the Stones to play on stage. And I don't think they've ever. I think I don't. I don't remember they ever played in the '60s, but they haven't played. They re- played it on the 90, yeah 1966 US tour. And there's a. A bit of a ropey quality bootleg of, uh, round of uh, Honolulu, and uh, <laughs> the thing, interesting thing about that is uh, it, it was the last show of the tour, and uh, Mick Jagger at the end uh, introduced a song. I think it was Satisfaction. He said, uh, "Good night. This is the last song, something along the lines for our last show ever." <laughs> I don't know if he really thought that at the time, or he was just joking. But yeah, because this was round about the time when the Beatles stopped touring as well. And now look at them. We're looking forward to the next tour. It's like... <laughs> so, so then it's sort of true then that at some point it did say something to the nature of last something because they always yeah. said that we've never said that. Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah. Oh, fantastic! You said that was sixty six. Yeah, that, oh, yeah, August sixty six, I believe. Yeah, yeah, offhand. Yeah, July or August somewhere. So, right about the time when the Beatles did their final shows. Yeah, I suppose it was driving all of them mad. But then, uh, but then, then the. Uh, the Rolling Stones did a, a UK autumn tour, and then they did a European tour in, uh, in March or April 1967. But but then, of course, all the problems with the drug bus and Brian Jones' deterioration. But, uh, and, and had a break until, well, 69, basically. You know, but, uh, but yeah, you know, they, they didn't stop for long, you know. Right. Oh, that's fantastic. I didn't know that. Well, so they are guilty of announcing a last show. <laughs> yeah, probably the only time, yeah. I mean... <laughs> Every press conference on every tour, you know, and Mick Jagger says, yo, well, it's not going to be the last one. It's not our final tour. <laughs> and then they said it then. You know, so. I think my favorite, the, the bookend to all that stuff is I think around 97 at the press conference for Bridges to Babylon, I, I believe someone asked, Keith, is this going to be the last tour? And he said, yes, and the next five or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And of course, we all kept count, like, oh, three more, two more, you know. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Peter, this this book, Undercover, is, is, is so fun because what I do is I'll sit in front of YouTube with the book and just go through, go through the list, you know, and, and, and thumb through it and read all the selections. And, and you know, with 500 covers, I'm discovering 100% of them are, are new to me at this point, you know, and uh, it's fantastic. So... Um, in in that whole five hundred, were there a few that stuck out in good ways and in bad ways, and made you go, "Oh boy!" Because uh, your your good line is that you listen to five hundred because uh, we didn't we wouldn't have to. Well, no, I listened to more than that, so you didn't have oh. to. I'm listening to something like t- about two thousand, so you didn't have to. Some some to be honest, I played uh, ten seconds. I think no, no, <laughs> yeah, and then chose the five hundred from that. Yeah, so I want that book too. By the way. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean it's an interesting story. So uh, I don't know if you, you're familiar in in the in the USA of Cliff Richard. He was a uh, oh, six and again. Cliff Richard. Cliff oh, Richard. I've heard of Cliff Richard. I don't know much well, of his material. Well, he's had more hits in this country in the UK than anywhere else. But he's always had a do goody uh, image sort of thing, and uh, yeah, he became a born again Christian, blah blah. But in 1966, he did a great cover of Blue Turns to Grey, one of my favourite covers. But uh. He, I believe he got it from Dick and Dee Dee's version. And it was only afterwards he promoted it. And someone said, did you know that's a Jagger Richards song? And he was against the Rolling Stones because they was ever, ever thinking, you know, against what he stood for, you know, being a good family man and Christianity. And, well, well fast forward, uh, 2009, he did a, a farewell tour with, uh, with, with, with these band, The Shadows. And, uh, and he did every hit throughout the 50s and 60s, apart from that one. He still refuses to play it ever since he found as a Rolling Stones song. <laughs> that just gets me every time. Yeah, it's a fantastic version. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. 
You didn't have the internet then to look it up. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, yeah, you mentioned earlier, and uh, I had to look it up, but one that threw me for a loop, but and ended up being a great surprise, was that she was hot covered. How did you come across that she was hot co uh, covered? Was it the vitamin string quartet? Uh, I can't remember. Off, I think the vitamin string quartet was uh, she's so cold. Uh, can't, can't oh shit. Oh, she's so cold. Okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I think I did get she was hot. Uh, oh yeah, the Carl Hendricks trio. I, I can't even remember it off hand. To be honest, uh, well, as, as we know, even a lot of Rolling Stones fans don't particularly like Dirty Work, uh, the album, and I, I, I really struggled to find covers for that one. Yeah, you know, I wanted to represent every album, and uh, I, I, I wish actually there was more covers for the songs on a bigger bang. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's some really good songs. Yeah, you know, but. Uh, very overlooked. So, well, I'll have you know, Peter, that I'm going to be part of the army to change the opinion on Dirty Work because I feel like Dirty Work has been unfairly slagged over yeah, the years. I agree. I agree. I agree very much. Yeah, I, I loved it at the time. I, mean, I, I think, uh, to be honest, I probably quickly grew bored of it and didn't play it much after about three or four months. But uh, when I first got it, I thought, yo, this is good as anything. Yeah, but I actually loved it at the time. So, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 obviously, probably people who went through it, most of the people are probably thrown off by it, but because um, you know, aesthetically, it, it does kind of rub you a certain kind of way. Yeah. But, um, but looking back now, it's definitely not as offensive as people make it out to be. But the legend continued to stay, which was kind of lazy, I thought, by by most people to kind of just slag it off. I think the production's very dated. That big eighties U uh, two type drum sound, you know, it's a uh, you know. It's, uh... I think that's the worst thing. That uh, perhaps it should be remixed. But uh, I mean, some of Mick Jagger's vocal work on it is stellar. It really is, you know. I mean, he's really going for it. He, he sounds uh, well, as as the as Americans call it, pissed. You know, to us, pissed is one. But but angry, he sounds it. He sounds aggressive on it. You know, perhaps he was frustrated. You know, with with, with doing his overdubs. You know, when he wanted to do his solo work. But but he sounds it. You know, and I think that's part of the appeal. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's a great album. Yeah, it's incredibly angry and dark which maybe that was the reason one of many reasons that people got put off because it's consistently aggressive throughout the whole album oh it really is yeah apart from uh is it sleep tonight at the end yeah where we've been you got you know keys yeah which it was a lovely ending it really is so. and i was gonna say you know i'm surprised if any if there was any song to cover off that i would imagine sleep tonight would have been a popular one that people could have latched onto. no you didn't find one huh can't remember offhand. I might have one in there actually. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, you have you have them all. Like you say, you got one from each album, and you, you you haven't missed one. You know, one that I was thinking about that would not be technically covered by your book because it wasn't officially recorded. But have you ever heard Bob Dylan do Brown Sugar on stage? Well, I have. Yeah, yeah. It's terrible. It really is. <laughs> I love Bob Dylan. I don't want to put. I don't want to insult yes, yes. Bob Dylan fans, but uh, yeah. It was a strange choice. It really was. Yeah, so. it, yeah it, you're right. I, it makes you wonder what made him gravitate to that song. I, maybe the lyric, because it is a very uh, provocative uh, lyric, you know, but um, I, I, every version I've heard, he always seems to flub up the second, one of the verses, <laughs> you know. But the band sounds fantastic. He, at the time when he was doing it, he had a great band, and um, yeah. it was nice to hear it, but... Um, yeah, my favorite. I had so many. Like I was saying, so I get. I have your book. I'm in front of YouTube. I just kind of flip through and go through all of them. And I had so many new ones that uh, made me go, "Oh, where has this been?" And you know, some that I love. Saint Saint Vincent's Emotional Rescue. That was yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, very smooth. And you know, it, it's 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 ones like that where you maybe you need a someone like a Saint Vincent to introduce it to new folks because you know. Her version and the Stones version are not too far off aesthetically. They're both kind of smooth and, you know, R and B ish and disco ish and funky. And um that blew me away. And also, um, I'm not sure if I'm gonna say her name right, but Casper Bjork. I'm not sure if that's her name, but Danish artist yeah. who did Heaven. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Heaven. Yeah. I, I was uh, very pleased to find a cover of Heaven. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting song. Uh, I mean, it's one of the just a handful. You could never imagine the Rolling Stones attempting live because it is just 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 so, so like that. But uh, but yeah, uh, go on. You're going to tell me that they performed it in 1998 or something? <laughs> no, they never performed that one. I don't think they have. No, no. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, I was very pleased. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, it is. It is. A, it is a very unique song. You know, it's very kind of got a very deep, heavy mood. I remember see, hearing it not for the first time, but being used in the movie Vanilla Sky um, in the early two thousands with Tom Cruise, and it was, you know, and, and it was just the right amount of it used, and you go, "Wow, good job for finding that one," because the Stones do have those mood pieces that yeah. it's not, it's not just heavy. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean uh, an album that was, uh, I think it's quite highly rated now, but uh, at the time it got mixed reviews, was uh, Black and Blue. But, you know, all these funk numbers on there. I, I know you use a snippet of uh, Hey Negrito. <laughs> yeah, which is a bit. But, yeah, I think I think that's a really good album, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm so glad to have seen that. Sometimes these songs, you know, they, they might not you know, make the impact of the time, but they have their time, yeah, right? Wait, what is that? Because I've heard, you know, people make that, uh, and I agree. Is it, is it, you know, you could write it off as, oh, the Stones were ahead of their time, you know, or, or what? But um, that always seems to be the case where, in retrospect, the album works better. Is it that we we vote, we have expectations on the Stones each time an album comes out? I think so. I, I mean, uh, a lot of people, and again, I, I, I really like the album, but a lot of people at the time, Goat said Soup, because I think they expected e Exile Part 2. Yeah, well, it, it wasn't. It had all these you know, more, more mellow uh, numbers. and uh, but, uh, but it must be difficult, you know, and, uh, 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 for, for, well, for, for any band, but particularly the Rolling Stones, because they want to hear all these you know, hard riffing songs. And but they can't win with it, basically. They, they turn these out again. People say, oh, it's the same old thing, same old thing. And then they do something new. Oh, it doesn't sound like the Rolling Stones. You know? So, you know, it, it, it's, it, it must be difficult for them. You know? and I, I think I can understand that. It's been 18 years for an album. You know, it's just, it's just, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're totally right. And, you know, all you need to do is go back to the beginning. I mean, look at those first singles. You know, a few of them could be related, but at the, the biggest point is, those early songs, you go from Under My Thumb to 19th Nervous Breakdown to Painted Black, Mother's Little Helper, you know, um, Street Fighting Man a little later. But, you know, that right there is a nice little selection of things from different angles. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'm so glad to hear you talk about Black and Blue because I think a lot of people would dismiss it because a lot of those songs um, on paper may not amount to much, you know, but... Um, that album has two things going for it, you know, this sense of rhythm. It's really this rhythm encyclopedia in a way of all these different styles of rhythm, um, reggae and blues and so forth. But it's also one of the most beautiful sounding mixed and mastered albums. It's just so punchy and clear. And uh, and and maybe the, the Rolling Stones, or maybe it's just their fans have come around to it, but over the last 20, 25 years, I think the Stones have performed most songs. Yeah, they might not, it might not be in the set list for long, but... Uh... I remember when they first dug out. Uh, I think it was around about ninety seven, ninety eight. Me Memory Motel, yo, it was, it was, it was, it was fantastic. See, even that, yo, know, duet with, uh, you know, with Mick and Keith doing doing that, yo. So, you know, it's so funny. Uh, I've always Memory Motel is, I guess, considered a fan favorite because it it was, um, it's kind of an obscure cut, but it's everyone's favorite, one of their favorite ballads, and you know, it's it's. There's something about the quality of that. It's almost like an early '60s cut because it's the craft of it to me. It's a very um, mature song for, a, well, I guess when they wrote it or came up with it, it was later into their career a bit. But still, nevertheless, it makes you go, "Wow, that's as good as their early stuff." Yeah, on the 1976 tour, songs like that they completely ignored. They, they didn't even play them live. You know, so it's even perhaps maybe they thought it was too difficult to recreate at the time or, or maybe, maybe you know they dismissed it and think oh it's, it's not that great but yeah so, but, so yeah you know um as i was going through all these different cover versions um from your book it, it got me thinking to a question that i've always been curious to ask other people and i know i have my own philosophies about it but it gets you thinking about cover songs in general and you know what it takes to or what the secret is for an artist to successfully cover a song. And uh, I know that it seems like there's two camps. It's either there's people who feel that people should be very faithful to the recording, or people want something that is a little different. Um, where do you sit on that kind of idea? I don't see the point of, unless you're a tribute actor, I don't see the point of just uh, you know doing note-for-note -note copies. I, I mean, uh, 
I mean, look at Satisfaction by Otis Redding. Yeah, you know, he really makes it his own. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know, the, I mean, don't, it's still recognisable as Satisfaction, though. It's but it's got the the Holmes doing do do yo know, look yeah, fantastic. And, and, and that to me, yeah, you, know, you you don't necessarily have to alter it completely out of recognition, but you, you know, but yeah, but, uh, but but make it your own. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Speaking of which, it seems like the Otis Redding version was the idea of what Keith wanted the so- the song to sound like from the go. I believe so. Yeah, he wanted horns, and he, he came across this distortion box. You know, and, uh, yeah, it was cheaper. You know, so. <laughs> Is that a true story that you know to them the t- the satisfaction? was, you know, a, practically a demo, a rough thing, and next thing you know, they're listening to it on the radio, not knowing that it was agreed by, I guess, Oldham to release it. That, that may well be true. I know uh, Keith in particular has spoken out over the years and said uh, a lot of the uh, the early singles, they're poorly mixed. You know, he, he don't like the mix of 90 Nervous Breakdown or Get Off of My Cloud. And maybe they are muddy, but, but, but I think that, that's part of the appeal, you know. After hearing them, you know, I'm 60 now and I've been here for 55 years, sort of thing. You know, I, was like, I wouldn't want them changed, Joe. You know, I wouldn't want them remixed. So. Yeah, no, absolutely not. And um, they have their, their charm, you know. Absolutely. And they, yeah. yeah, they're from the time. Um, well, that being said, I agree with you that I, I think um, for me, the success of a good cover song is that the artist is adding their own fingerprint to it, you know. Um, but with that, so with that being said, what would you say is a secret to covering? The secret to covering a stone song are there different rules for the stones uh because the stones are so you know impactful in their style do you think artists uh have to abide or work around certain rules when you're covering the stones no not necessarily i mean uh as i said i, I listened to over 2000 some of them i didn't necessarily reject them because they were rubbish but because they tried to copy the stones too too faithfully and they it was a bit boring you know it was, it was pointless listening to them. i might as well listen to the stones so I, I, I basically, you know, uh, full of book anyway, tried to choose uh, some that most of them, they, they, they've got a certain something. Uh, you, know, you might not necessarily like them or you might think they're great, but, uh, but they, they put their own stamp on, you know, the, the vast majority of uh, the, the covers I put in the book. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, the, the Stones themselves have covered so many songs. You know, another uh, interesting sequel or follow up uh, would be to write a something on the Stones covering others. Um, but um, they, especially their early career, did you feel that they honored a lot of those covers? They did so many, The Temptations, Buddy Holly, Chuck Berry. One of my favorite covers, and, and, and everyone thinks, said you're crazy. You know, it's awful, it's awful. My Girl. I love My Girl on the Flowers album. Yeah, the Stones version of My Girl. I just love the way Mick Jagger sings it. I really do. You know, to me, it blows away the temptations and I was just ready. And I'm probably the only person on the planet who thinks that. I love it. Oh my, I didn't and, know. You, and of course, uh, Under the Boardwalk was the number one in Australia. Oh, was it? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Whenever they go there, they never play it. But uh, yeah, yeah, it was the number one single in Australia. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. I, I have to admit, because I, like I mentioned uh to you before that, that anything pre aftermath, I'm a little hazy on. So I forgot that they did My Girl as well. That 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 was uh, quite bold. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I really think it was. It, it's got uh, strings on it as well. Uh, strings and strings overdub. Uh, Andrew Oldham and <laughs> supposedly uh, produced it, but you know, probably got someone else to do it. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, I love that version. I really do. But I don't imagine it live. Yeah. Right. Well, that would really throw people for a loop. I think people would love it. Well, talk, talking of live, uh, I, I've only seen them live uh, twice in 1990, and, and that was great at Wembley Stadium. And uh, and I actually, I, I didn't realise at the time, saw the last ever concert with Bill Wyman as a full time member, which was which was fantastic. Yeah, but, uh, oh, but anyway, but but, uh, but the last last tour last year, the thing that blew me away, and, and some people loved it, some people thought it was boring when they dug out out of time. You know, and the crowd obviously absolutely loved it as well. Yeah, you know, I don't know if you, if Keith or particularly liked it or Roddy, but uh, but yeah, and, and that 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 to me, you know, when they dig out gems like that, you know, it's, that's what gets me. Absolutely, and you know they've been doing that. Uh, it's sort of been like an unofficial tradition at this point now, uh, in the last few tours where they at least dig out one song they've never done before, and uh, you know credit I think needs to also go to Steve Jordan. Because it's on these early 60s songs where he is just kicking butt completely. Yeah. You know, I mean, 19 There Was Breakdown was just a 
hurricane of a song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and, uh, get off my plaid. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't want to put Charlie down. I absolutely loved uh, Charlie, but uh, I believe in later years with songs like that, he did do them more of a plodding tempo. You know, maybe he was getting older and around, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of drumming, you know, when you're well into your 70s, you know, for two and a half hours, you know, sort of thing. But, uh, but yeah, Steve Jordan on some of these those songs like that, yeah, the energy is unbelievable. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, and, you know, you know, my God, we're all, we all adore Charlie and nothing against him. But, you know, your tastes change. Your, 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 where you are in life changes. And, you know, all those early 60s songs had this element of punk to it, you know, just attitude and, and anger really uh kind of underneath it a little bit so it gave it a little bit more weight you know and and um in the later years um they would do the last time like in the 90s and so forth they did the last time and they didn't do 2000 2012 they did the last time too and even then you could tell it was it was somewhere in between where it was a little bit like the original but it was also a little lighter on its feet and um when steve came around he really connected with that original vibe you know and so yeah. out of time was just yeah i think i think in an, in, in any other universe where well if they had played it when charlie was around, i don't think he would have survived after night one or two no i don't i don't know but yeah <laughs> oh, that's fantastic you know and, and speaking of which so you know um those early 60s songs and but this is really your era isn't it your favorite go-to spot which is the brian jones era yeah, uh, what it was, I was born in 63, and uh, I, 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 my memory of listening to me on the radio probably dates back, you know, to about 60, 67, 68. But my parents had, uh, and I still think it's the greatest compilation ever made, the UK version of Big Hits, High Tide and Green Grass, which was sort of like the greatest hits uh, compilation. And and to me, it's still the most perfect, every song, yeah. And I listened to it so many times growing up. Yo, know, yeah, you know, I know what's coming next. Yo, know, and, and if I, I am out of order, another compilation. So, where's come on? You know, where, yeah, where, where's not fade away? Yeah, you know, it's just like, yeah. and but that that yeah, and, and and ever since then, yeah, the, the since I was probably four or five, the Rolling Stones, Brian Jones, uh, yeah, it just yeah, just, just blows me away. Sometimes I go away from it. I don't listen to it so much for a few months. I listen to it, but. A bit of soul or a bit of rock and roll or a bit of all, all sorts of music, but but then I come back. I mean, today I let this interview coming out, and I've been playing somewhere between the buttons and out of your head, out of our head, and uh, it, it just blow me away. It really do. So, yeah. And and I was mentioning to you before that this early era is a little rough for me to, you know, reach. You know, especially when you're coming from one angle to the next, and. This is the, an area that you favor. What would you What would you say are some of the attributes that makes this era so special for you compared to the Mick Taylor years, which is for a lot of people their, you know, focus, their centerpiece for the band? Well, two words: Brian Jones. <laughs> it, it, especially you know from uh, from sixty five, sixty six, sixty seven. He, he he just put so many. Uh, I mean, I mean, Keith Richards complains now that, uh, and, and perhaps rightly, that Brian Jones got bored with the guitar, and I think he did, you know. And, but but instead, you know, he added all these textures, you know, and you know, some something like between the buttons, it's got this weird mix. But all these layers, you listen to in stereo on the headphones, you got something coming here, something coming here. It's it, it just, you know, it, it just mind-boggling. And I, I did read a list somewhere. He plays something like eight different instruments on that album. You know, it's, it's <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And that's a thing that I've appreciated recently because, like I was telling you earlier, that I was sort of getting into Between the Buttons. That, that that was only within the last three years, two or three years for me, that Between the Buttons really finally clicked, you know. And it just goes to show that for me, it's a process. The seed has to be planted and then it, you hope to water it over the years and then it grows into this big thing. And with Between the Buttons, it threw me for a loop. You know, I don't, I don't know. You may have seen, uh, I put a video on YouTube about it being part of my Overlooked album series, but it's the most yeah. um, English sounding uh, of all the albums. But then again, a lot of the albums during this time sounded very English to me, you know? Yeah. I mean, I mean, some people say they was, uh, you know, trying to uh, copy the Kings and the Small Faces or that Swing in London vibe. But, but I think they're forgetting, you know, until, you know, the end of the 60s or early 70s, 
they lived. That's where they lived. They, they, they was partying in London all the time. You know, they was soaking up. You know, they was on Ready Steady Go. You know, they was part of that culture. So I think they was just really reflecting what was around them. I don't think they was trying hard to be more more English. You know, and and really, I suppose they became American. Yeah, you know, I'm not putting Americans down or yourself, but uh, but they they sort of became more Americans once they all moved to New York and places like that and soaked up the American culture. You know, so but. Uh, but, but they were, they yeah, were an English band, you know, and, uh, and, and that was just a reflection of the time. So, I mean, they couldn't make an album like that now, you know, they, they really couldn't because, because, you know, they're so, they're, they're so worldwide and, you know, living in Jamaica or New York or wherever they, they live these days. But, uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah, I think it's a really important reflection of the times and, uh, and, it, and as good as anything else to me, you know, it's as good as Revolver and it's good as, you, you know, some of the best uh, early Who albums or the Kings or whatever, you know, it's, it's good as pet sounds. Well, it's better than pet sounds, but it's So I love that. <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> oh no, I love the Beach Boys too. And, and yeah. um, but yeah, you know, they're, that's what that's what I came to realize recently was that you know, between the buds was always a mystery to me. But then you do the math and you go, holy crap, this is um, some very interesting, strong stuff. You know, uh, regard forget about it being the Rolling Stones. You know, just for any band, and you know, I like that point. And and people often forget conveniently that, you know, whether you like it or not, the Stones are sponges, really. You know, when it comes to their surroundings and the time that they're in and all those things. So to always point fingers that they're always they're copying someone or um, that they're not being original. You know, it, it misses the point that. Um, there's, there's, the, they have their roots, but they're always incorporating new things. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, people, you know, very wrongly, you know, uh, dismiss uh, Satanic Majesties as, as, as their version of Salt and Pepper. But to me, it's the dark side. It's like looking in the mirror, you know, seeing <laughs> like the devil looking back at you. You see, every, I mean, look at the difference between, you know, with a little help from our friends, like, get by, then he got in another land. Yeah, you know, it's all so much darker, and Gompers so much darker. 2000 light years from home. Even she's a rainbow. There's, there's, there's all these you know, discordant uh, touches to it. It's just, I, I, I think that's a really interesting album as well. I, I know Mick Jagger's the only one who, who talks highly of it these days, but yeah, I, I really like that album. Yeah, I'm so glad you, to, to hear you say that because I also, that was part of the twofer for me between the buttons and their Satanic Majesty's request where I said, hey, it's time for me to, to sit with these now. And yeah, you know, it, it's, it's very lazy for people to just group it oh it's a sergeant pepper uh knockoff where okay you know maybe the cover has echoes of it obviously you know isn't it the same photographer who did um both i think you're probably right like, yeah i can't remember off hand yeah but yeah it's a, it's a bit like saying beggar's banquet is, is their version of the white album yeah they can't they can't be more different you know just because they got a similar cover you know <laughs> right yeah Jeez, i never put that together you're right and they're both kind of very um raw and kind of uh yeah sort of back to basics in a way yeah sort of thing yeah yeah more stripped down yeah without all these uh, orchestras and fancy touches yeah yeah right and 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 at least going back with satanic majesties and and maybe you know sergeant pepper you know it, it's not like those two albums came out of no, complete nowhere there was something brewing in the community you know there was it was all around them so um the only thing that the stones are guilty of is just participating in, you know, what was going on around them. So to 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 narrow it down as it being a knockoff of anyone in particular, it seems like less a little bit one dimensional. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and they, they was heading in that direction uh, already. You know, things like uh, Dandelion was written. You know, I, I believe you know late summer, nineteen sixty six. You know, and uh, yeah, so so that's. And, and I know Dandelion isn't on the album, but you could imagine it being part of uh, Satanic Majesties, you know, and We Love You, which I think is absolutely out there single. I, absolutely blows me away still. <laughs> if I had to choose, they're, they're, my favourite one is Don't Sing, but be We Love You and, and Dandelion as a, as a, as, you know, as a, as a two-sider. That's, that's amazing. You know, and uh, yesterday, I because you mentioned it, I wanted to bring it out, but I was listening to this, Got Live If You Want It, <laughs> uh, I have this is the SACD too, so it sounded extra nice. I love all these digit packs they put out in 2002. They sound fantastic, and I have to say I haven't heard this in a long time, and uh, I was mighty impressed with it. I was having fun listening to it. 
some of the editing on it is, is diabolical. And as you know, two of the songs, they're, they're just studio songs that are overdubbed. But, but the energy, I mean, you, you listen to uh, Under My Thumb or uh, Not Fade Away, 19th Nervous Breakdown. Get off of my cloud. It's primal on that. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about Steve Georgia. You know, you know, they came close, you know, which, which was amazing in 2022. But, but I mean, they've invented punk rock there. They really have. Oh, yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking about because, uh, was it get off my cloud? Definitely get off my cloud. Uh, even under my thumb straight away, it's yeah. you're on to something incredible. And, um, I was like, this can't be Charlie, you know, <laughs> I mean, like he is pounding his way through this. I mean, they're, uh, the tempos by the way, are also off the charts. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, are they? they must've been wild. They, they must've been, obviously Char- I doubt Charlie was, but, uh, yeah, he's keeping up with them. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, maybe he's hitting ever hard and, you know, hard because he can't hear himself, you know, just screaming and everything, you know, just bashing away, you know, but, uh, yeah, but <laughs> the energy yeah. on that really is incredible, yeah. I mean, how can you not get carried away with it? I mean, when you have all that energy in that room, I mean, it sounds like they want to get out of there, but it's more like, well, we just want to give them what they're giving us. Yeah, 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 it really is, yeah. And and even when they dig out, I, I, and I believe it was still... Uh, it was uh, uh, recorded on that tour, not fade away. I mean, that's something, you know, it's probably two and a half years old, which was a lifetime in, in, in those years. But they're putting so much enthusiasm in it, so much drive, you know, it's... it's so, little... so you'll go on record saying that this is the their best live album, huh? Well, it's my favourite. It's, it's definitely, yeah, there's a, yeah. I'm, I mean, you know, I, I'm not going to put Mick, da- Mick Taylor down. Though, uh, if I had to choose, I prefer Ronnie Wood. I think he, he'd fit in better, but that's another discussion. But, uh, but yeah, oh, yeah, uh, you know, get your yaws out and these uh, bootlegs that have come out since. Yeah, fantastic. But you compare, I don't know, something like Under My Thumb, the energy on those 1966 recordings compared to 1969, 1970, you know, it's, it's, it's almost a completely different band. But, but obviously, you know, the. The intricacy of the playing, you know, Midnight Rambler in 69 and even better, 72 or whatever, you know, absolutely fantastic. And even now, you know, you know it's different. It's just different, you know. Yeah, and I don't know. For me, that's one of the things that I love about the band is that things become different constantly, you know, so they keep you on your toes. And for some people, that kind of rubs them the wrong way, which is too bad. Um, you know, as, as we wind down here, I want to I wanna ask you one more thing about this era. You know, since this is your favorite era, what would you say were some of the things that may have been lost or gained in a different way once they transitioned into Mick Taylor or then Ronnie Wood? But obviously the Jones era had a specific flavor to it, didn't it? I think the, uh, the best tribute they did to Brian Jones is not trying to replace him. They got someone so completely different, and uh, which, was, which was very, very wise. They, did, they, did, they wasn't looking for a multi-instrumentalist dandy, you know, so, you know, you know, they, you know I mean, Mick Taylor, you know, fantastic musician, but, you know, he, he wasn't a showman, you know, he, he's not, not a showman like Brian Jones or Keith Richards or Mick Jagger, and, uh, and wisely. And, uh, yeah, yeah, they, they lost, uh, perhaps, perhaps it was time. I mean, it, I couldn't imagine, you know, if Brian Jones had lived in fit, fitting in on Sticky Fingers or something like that. I'd, 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 maybe he would, but I, I, yeah, and certainly not on some girls, you know. I'd, I'd, I'd just could, I'd, I'd, I'd just could, I just couldn't imagine him, yeah. So, so maybe, maybe they did the right things at the right time, yeah, with uh, Mick Taylor. And then, uh, I know it wasn't their initial ch- choice because Mick Taylor, you know, quit. But, uh, but Ronnie Wood, uh, I mean, Bill Wyman, he, as you know, probably, uh, probably he's, he's gone on record as saying, you know, uh, he loved Mick Taylor's playing. He was the be- best player we ever had in the Rolling Stones, but he wasn't right. And having Ronnie Wood, it just brought the, brought the band back to life again. And, and that's, a, that's, that's, that's where Bill Wyman uh, uh, feels it. And, and I can see that in a way, you know, the playing might not have been so int- intricate, you know, he, he might not be, you know, the musician. He's very underrated, but, uh, but, but yeah, but, 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 but that's what, that's what I think they, they, they lost, you know, they, you know, just, just Brian Jones was so unique, you know, he really was in, in every way. Oh man, what a thought, you know, imagine Brian Jones on Undercover, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What would he look like? <laughs> man, you thought that Dirty Work cover was bad. Yeah, <laughs> that is a fault. Yeah, I, I, well, one more thing. I mean, so, someone's uh, obviously uh, you know Keith Richards. You know, he was into drugs to a certain extent. You know, pills and whatever, and cannabis throughout the sixties. But I, I think uh, 
as some people have pointed out, in a way, he replaced Brian Jones as be as being the, the indulgent one. You know, up up until uh, up until uh, Brian Jones died, you know, it was Brian Jones who was always too wasted to play. You know, and every, and then Keith Richards, you know, throughout, throughout the early seventies, certainly, you know, but he became Brian Jones in a way. You know, because he was the he was the one who was you know. I couldn't rely on uh, so much. So. And it, it's pretty much well known, right? Or is it misunderstood that, you know, around the time things started to pick up for the Mick Jagger, Keith Richards songwriting and the hits started to come, that Brian wasn't really jiving with what was going on there. I mean, I don't think he rather enjoyed satisfaction in all the that that direction or stuff. Am I? Do I have that right or wrong? I'm not sure about that, but I don't, th- I don't think he was... Uh particularly into Beggar's Banquet, you know, the Back to Basics. Uh, maybe he was just too out of it then, you know. You know, you know I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. It's hard to say how much of that was Brian Jones being completely out of it and how much is it, you know, he just wasn't interested in the street violin man or whatever. You know, it's, it's hard to say, you know, but I think he was into satisfaction and things like that. Um, well, with all this, all these classics that we're talking about, upcoming are the Stones' new album, coming up soon 18 years in the making is it something you'll be listening to oh absolutely oh very much so yeah i mean you know brian jones there might be my favorite but, but yeah i, I love, love all, all the stones yeah uh, as i said earlier I, I thought bigger bang was a really good album you know uh, if i had to choose my uh, my least favorite album and, uh, and people say you're mad it's voodoo lounge not all of it, but but some of the anthems on it, they're a bit too stones by numbers. You got me rocking and things like that. You know, uh, I mean, there is some good uh, deeper cuts on it. I know that, but uh, but yeah, but I, I really like the uh, bigger bang, and it's a shame they didn't keep uh, the songs in their set uh, sets longer. They yeah. did it for that tour, and then you know, by the by the next tour, yeah, they, they dropped them all. So that'd be a nice surprise if for this tour they brought back some of those other ones because I mean, it says a lot that hey, I mean, I think the only one that really stayed in the set. Was you got me rocking that 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 has made a consistent appearance throughout all the tours since then. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> it drives me mad. That so I never liked it much. I don't know why. It's just I don't know. It's like, I mean, I, I mean, simple is good, but I, yeah, it's just something about it. I just I just don't like that. Sparks will fly is a little bit bad. Then I don't know. I mean, a highlight last time. I, I, I might have been the last night of the tour, but he did uh, out of control. They, they dug it out of control, didn't they? And a fantastic version. And and. Uh, and I think they enjoy that sometimes when they dig out, you know, something they haven't done in a long while. And I think Out of Control is such a strong song. It could be up there with all their classics to me. I think it's a well-written song. Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. You know, Peter, this has been such a joy to chat with you. And, and it got me thinking, to, listening and watching to uh, all these clips that, you know, it, it it made me realize what I think makes a cover version work so well. It, I feel like it has to do two things. It has to make it remind me how much I love the original who, the, by the original artist. And in second, it, it should make me fall in love with the artists covering them to make me explore their music. You know, so it has to be kind of the cyclical thing going on. Yeah, yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, absolutely. And your book does that constantly where I'm going, Oh wow. Let me look into this person. Let me look into that person because you know, like you were saying, if it's done well, it gives the, it gives their fingerprint on the music. And um, it's like a little trail to lead them to their music. And that's, I did that many times throughout the book. So I thought it was um, a great, great experience. Will there be any more Stones books in your future? I'd like to. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm currently writing, and I'm sure none of your viewers would be interested, but I'm writing, and it's almost officially approved, a book on the tremolos. They've never, there's never been a book on the tremolos. And then, you know, it's like, so yeah, my tastes do vary a bit, but they, they tend to, and I did one on Jeffrey Lewis earlier earlier in, in the year. So um, my, my tastes tend to be mostly you know fifties rock and roll, rhythm and blues, you know Chuck Berry. I love Chuck Berry, both of you, and 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 sixties pop and sixties rhythm and blues. You know the the, the tougher ones, are, you know, obviously Rolling Stones, Pretty Things, you know, and, uh, Yardbirds, the Animals, people like that. You know, the Animals. I might write a book on the Animals. Oh, that should be fun. There's probably not enough books about them. No, it's definitely not. No. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, yeah, I, I was looking through your um, your other books, and they were all up my alley. You know, I love the '50s stuff. I'm a huge Elvis fan, uh, actually, as well. Oh, so, right. yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, talk about a something on Elvis, but again, I need a I need a new angle. Uh, yeah, the good luck because that would be tough. I mean, but then again, you know, your own point of view is already special enough, you know, no matter what you uh, write. But uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, anyone talking about the the music, you know, in in great detail like you do, I think I would be much welcome for Elvis. Yeah. You know, it seems like people like to focus on the more. Um, other details of his life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's all about the music to me. You know, it, it really is. You know, uh, uh, and, and that's that's what I, I stick to. You know, I, I try and keep away from any uh, controversies. You know, when I'm writing about artists. You know, it's just, I mean, a lot of them people know about the controversies anyway. I, I, I want to, I want to, you know, point out the music. Yeah, you know, and what's good about it. Yeah, no, smart move. Um, well, this book is a complete joy. Undercover. It's called, and uh, the book is really, really celebrates the Stones music in a great way and puts it all in one place. Uh, really, every Stones fan should have it. Uh, Peter, can you tell us where to find the book and more information about you? Well, the book, uh... yeah, it's at Amazon, the uh, biggest bookshop in the world, so you can get it in in any country, really. And uh, and myself, well, I got into writing about. Uh, well, it was. Uh, I'll keep it as short as I can. Uh, I was always uh, writing this and you know bits for blogs and all that. And my other half uh, said to me, "You know, why don't you try and put a book together?" And I did. I just put one book together, and that was going to be it. That that was going to be the, the end of it. Then a couple of months after that, I had a heart attack. <laughs> I'm absolutely fine now, you know, but I needed uh, you know, emergency surgery, and I couldn't get out walking and cycling so much. So I did another book. You know, I did another book, and it's sort of I'm addicted now. So. <laughs> So yeah, so so it, good things come out of bad things. They really do. So right, and you know the stones taught us that you know just keep rolling forward, pushing through, yeah. no matter what yeah. the universe gives you. Yeah. Well, fantastic, Peter. Thank you so much for taking the time. Really enjoy the chat with you, and I hope we can do it again. Thank you, thank you, Justin. Enjoyed it. Hey everybody, I enjoyed the songs from Peter's book so much that I created a playlist on Spotify of fifty of my favorite covers from his massive list. Be sure to check it out. The link is in the description below. Thanks for watching Hangfire.